uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Visonte, and I'm the editor of Plus 61 Joe Media. Welcome to the second of our Zoom conversations about Crossroads 21, our exclusive survey of Australian attitudes to Jewish people, anti-Semitism and Israel. Our first conversation three weeks ago was a discussion about the Crossroads finding on Jewish people and anti-Semitism. Tonight, we'll be looking at Australian attitudes towards Israel. Although the findings from our survey date from earlier this year, uh, tonight's event is very timely given the recent conflict between Israel and Hamas, and that is something we will look at later in the conversation. Before I introduce our panel tonight, uh, some quick housekeeping. Uh, our discussion will go for 30 to 35 minutes, after which we'll take questions from the audience. If during uh, the conversation you want to make a comment, uh, please use the chat function on your screen for that. If you want to ask a question of the panelists, um, you uh, can choose the Q&A function, which is the icon at the bottom of your screen, which we can access as we speak, and we'll choose a selection of your questions to ask our panelists. And now, without further delay, let me introduce you to them. Uh, Murray Good here in Sydney and over in Israel, Judy Mullis. Uh, Murray, uh, or should I call him Emeritus Professor Murray Good, is formerly an Australian Research Council Australian Prof Professorial Fellow and a distinguished professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Macquarie University. He's a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a life member and past president of the Australian Political Studies Association. Murray has written widely on public opinion and is currently working on a history of opinion polling in Australia. Judy Maltz is a senior writer for the Haaretz English edition, where she covers a wide range of topics with special focus on the Jewish world and Israel diaspora relations. A recipient of the Benet Brith Prize for Excellence in Reportage on the Diaspora, Judy has also produced and directed two award-winning documentaries on Jewish and Israeli topics, one of which was screened in Australia about 10 years ago. In addition to this, uh, had it not been for COVID, Judy had planned to be in Australia a year ago this month, working on a special project about the Australian Jewish community. She tells me that project is still on her agenda, and if all goes well, she hopes to come here next year and meet many of you in person. So, Murray and Judy, welcome. Uh, Murray, I think I'll start with you. Uh, the Crossroads survey found, uh, if I can summarize, uh, in, in relation to Australian attitudes towards Israel, uh, generally balanced sympathies by Australians towards Israel and the Palestinians over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, uh, 62%. And uh, that finding and those views have remained stable for the past five years. But it must be said, uh, they're in the context of a generally low level of interest and knowledge of the Middle East. So can I start by asking you, um, did these and any other findings surprise you? Uh, what did you find most surprising about these surveys? Well, <laughs> Michael, I think it's true to say that uh, if you look at the size of the don't know vote, both equally or you know, in indifference, uh, as you say, the sympathies are generally balanced. But if you look at the responses outside of those that say um, we're sympathetic with both Israel and the Palestinians, you find sympathy for Israel is 11% compared to the Palestinians 19 You've got another question which says the government's not critical enough in which 47% agree against 22% that disagree. Australian policy is about right, 38% disagree versus 27% agree. So the, the, uh, whereas the bulk of people are not particularly interested, that's perfectly true, and in my view are largely indifferent, those that are interested are on the whole, more likely to incline to a pro-Palestinian than a pro-Israeli view. Whether the views are stable or not, it's impossible to say. We simply have their self-reporting that these, for most of them, about 80%, these are the views that they've held for five years, or at least the same views five years ago. But even there, if you look at the people reporting change, there's been a five percentage points drop in the sympathy for Israel on their own report, a five percent 
increase in sympathy for the Palestinians. So it's possible, given the small balances between the two sides, that in fact, the last five years, sympathy has flipped from marginally in favor of Israel to marginally or more than marginally in favor of the Palestinians. Um, the low level of interest is, I think, beyond dispute and not surprising. Right. So are you surprised by uh, what you say is the flipping of those sympathies? Uh, not really. My sense is that um, sympathies are moving away from Israel and towards the Palestinians, and this has been true, I think, for quite a long time. Uh, the, the, the most, the, maybe it's not the most surprising result, maybe it's not surprising at all. The most interesting result has got to do with something I'm sure you'll want to talk about later, and that is the relationship between the vote, anti-Semitism, and uh, sympathy with Palestinians. Mm. That's yeah, we'll the, come, that's yeah, we'll the come most to that I think you want to talk about that. Yeah, later. we'll come to that in, in the context yeah. of the conflict. Uh, I might just throw to uh, Judy now uh, for a sort of a, a general response. Uh, what was there, if anything, in these results that surprised you, Judy? Was it the balance of sympathies or, or, or otherwise, the, the lack of knowledge and, and interest in the Middle East? Uh, was there anything in particular? So I'm wondering if maybe the things that surprised me were a little different because I'm not from Australia and I'm looking at, at it from a different place. Yes. So I, I think what actually surprised me most was the fact that so many Australians were under the impression that the Jewish population is much, much larger than it actually is. Uh, if I remember correctly, about 80% of the respondents had no idea how tiny the Jewish population of their own country was, and nearly half of them were under the impression that it, the Jews accounted for more than 5% of the total Australian population. So that to me is an indication of how very visible and influential Jews must be in Australian society. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong. Um, by the way, I'm pretty sure that if you pose the same question to Americans, the responses would probably be similar. Uh, yeah. In other words, I imagine the average American is convinced that the Jewish population in the country is much higher than two and a half percent, which by the way is much larger than the Jewish population of Australia. So that was one thing. Uh, the other thing that surprised me, or maybe I should say I, I found it rather ironic was that nearly two thirds of Australians supported a ban on the swastika. While nearly a third said they knew little or virtually nothing about the Holocaust. Mm. In other words, they, they seem to feel very, very strongly about banning the Nazi symbol, but at the same time, weren't all that knowledgeable about what atrocities the, the Nazis had committed. Um, I guess I find that ironic as well, considering that Australia has one of the largest populations of survivors in the world. Mm. So I would have thought they might know more. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Regarding okay. knowledge, okay. yeah, go, go on. on. Oh, oh well, no. look, uh, uh, you, you seem to have an American accent, so I, uh, I think you're familiar with America in terms of diaspora uh, attitudes and, and populations. Um, can you uh, shed any light on how Australian, uh, these results from Australia sit with other diaspora communities? Okay, so th this is uh, interesting. But, well, we're not actually talking about a diaspora community in Australia because it was a survey that you did of the general right, population. You're right, yes, yeah. Right? Um, but what I, what I did see as uh, perhaps indicative of a worldwide trend um, going back to what Murray spoke, spoke about was, yes, there seems to be um, a growing, uh, growing sympathy for the Palestinian cause. And I would suggest that maybe one of the reasons is that uh, young people, uh, not only in Australia, we're seeing it in the United States as well, tend to identify, or those who consider themselves progressive, tend to identify more with the Palestinian cause. Yeah. And I guess over the years, you're getting more and more young people in, into this survey. Yeah. So um, 
I think it was the 18 to 24 year old bracket, we saw that 25%, uh, a full quarter in this group, group said they had a high level of sympathy for the Palestinians compared with only 13% who said they did in the 45 to 54 age bracket. Yeah. So it's almost twice as much, which is, which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, about a week after your survey came out, Pew put out a huge survey of American Jewry. It's the first big survey they've done of American Jewry in the past seven years. And we saw a similar trend there among young American Jews. Yeah. When they were asked whether caring about Israel was an essential part of what being Jewish meant to them, only 35% of those in the youngest age category said that it was. And that compares with 52% of those age 65 and older. You know, the same was true when they were asked if they thought the US was too supportive of Israel. But, th but these was of Jews, of Jews, not, not of the general American oh, population. Yeah. I'm looking at a generational difference here. Yeah. Which yes, is that's right, yeah. Uh, on that so, note, uh, I'd like to go back to Murray. Murray, you've had a lot of experience as a researcher in, in this general field. And so we've talked, both of you have talked really about how um, sympathies and awareness of the um, Palestinian uh, side of the conflict has, um, has grown. I guess it raised the question about uh, research like uh, Crossroads. Um, it's been a long time really since something uh, this substantial was conducted into, into the general Australian population um, about this subject. Why would that be, do you think? Oh, I'm not sure anything like this on quite on the scale has been conducted before. I could be wrong. Mm. Um, if it has, it's probably not since your work was done for UNESCO in the 1940s. Mm. Really? Uh, but the reason th there was some work on anti-Semitism and so on, mm. but, but most of the polling, there's been very little. It's very sporadic, uh, single shot questions, and they move on to something else. So the last polling that I'm aware of is dates to 2006 on the conflict in Israel. And, uh, and if you ask me why, I would say for two, the lack of polling since for two reasons. One is there's not much political interest. This is not a big issue in Australia politically. Mm. Neither side has tried to make this an argument with the other on the whole. And the other thing is just a decline of polling by the media around issues. Um, so uh, it's what I call the collapse of the Gallup model. And it's, uh, it's more than just in Australia. There's a movement away from asking about people's positions on issues to asking questions about vote intention, about leaders. And insofar as instant issues, it's about which party would be the best party on interest rates, foreign policy, defense, and so on. Single issues like Israel are not often addressed. Right. So uh, raise an interesting question. You, you talk about uh, uh, a lack of pol political interest in the Middle East in Australia. Um, Judy mentioned a similar thing in the United States. And yet, when we get a big uh, eruption of conflict in that part of the world, uh, it becomes uh, instant front page news and um, very substantial uh, coverage in the media. So um, is that just a normal pattern that the, the media likes to focus on conflict, black and white, um, and it doesn't really reflect what's of concern to Australians? Um, well, I don't, think, I don't think Israel is of great concern to Australians. And that's one of the things which comes out, you know, people are asked about their level of interest. And, you know, what's it say? Not at all interested, 35%, a little bit, 31%, somewhat 24%. I don't know what the difference is between little and somewhat. Yeah. And then you've got very interested, which is the other category, 8%. Mm. Um, so I don't think the media is failing to represent an interest that people have and, and, and fighting to pursue it. Right. Uh, Judy, what would you say about that? Well, I would agree, you know, Australia is far away. What happens in the Middle East doesn't really have such a di direct impact on the lives of most Australians. I'm sure Jewish population cares a lot about what happens, but again, 
very, very small percentage of the, fan, of, of the population. But I think maybe another difference is that, um, again, if we're comparing it to the United States, the situation in the United States, uh, where also this story is top of the news, but uh, there's other reasons for that. I mean, obviously the traditional US involvement in the region and the US being a superpower and all that. But another thing uh, I would suggest is that America gives Israel billions of dollars a year in aid. The Australian government does not. And that is always an issue that comes up when there are uh, debates about US policy. Um, there's always a question of why are we are giving our taxpayer money to a country whose policies we don't agree with? And I guess that's that's not an issue in Australia, but you know this came up right now again. All the billions that Israel is getting and what it's using it for. Yeah, uh, Maria, I'd like to just ask you about uh, the alignment of the findings, or, or otherwise, with the political parties in terms of sympathies for Israel and Palestinians. Was there anything in that that uh, caught your eye in terms of? Uh, the Conservative Australian uh, Liberal National Coalition uh, and Labor uh, and Green voters? Uh, this is what I was alluding to earlier, is the most, what I thought was the most interesting part of the survey, um, because you've got Labor and Green voters scoring relatively low on anti-Semitism and most likely to support the banning of the Nazi symbol on the one side, but Green and Labor voters being four or five times more sympathetic to the Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis. Right. So now, this... this goes to the question, this is interesting, hmm. because it goes to the question, which is a very important question, of whether opposition to Israel's policies are really just a cover for anti-Semitism. And on the face of it, the survey suggests they're not. But there is a caveat, and that is the possibility that Green and Labour voters, being better educated, are also cannier about what is the correct response to anti-Semitic items in a survey. And that's an open question, I think, uh, where we need rather more sophisticated research than was possible with this particular survey. But on the face of it, um, I think it's pretty good news. So you're suggesting the heretical thought that some of these uh, respondents have gamed the survey? Well, it's possible. You have to entertain that. And yeah. I'm not the first person to raise the question when you see this sort of, uh, when you see the sort of result, um, because there is a strong belief among some people that criticism of Israel's policies are not really about Israel's policies. This is just a way of expressing anti-Semitism without being openly anti-Semitic. So this is a very big question and an important one. And it, the data suggests it's one worth pursuing. Yeah. Judy, uh, what do you, well, two questions. What do you think uh, about that relationship, whether you know, one is a proxy for the other? And, and what do you think that Israelis, uh, how do you think they, they see that issue? Well, first of all, I thought it was very interesting what Murray, what Murray said, because I had also noticed that, I guess you might say it kind of goes against the conventional wisdom that, you know, usually people are anti-Zionist or very, very critical of, uh, of Israel. There tends to be this hidden agenda of anti-Semitism and these findings would, would show the opposite. So, so that's really interesting. And it made me think uh, about, um, there was a survey, I think it was last year or the previous, hard to remember during COVID, you know, time is very different, but um, that the ADL did where they compared anti-Semitism in, in a bunch of different countries. And the country that came out as number one or number two was South Africa. And the South African Jewish community was up in arms about this. And they said, there's no way, this is the least anti-Semitic country in the world. How can you say that? We have the fewest incidents of anti-Semitism anywhere. And it turned out that the ADL was basing it really on these sort of questions, which try to gauge um, 
your preconceptions, you know, questions like, do the Jews control the media? Yeah. Are Jews good in business? And so what the South African Jewish community was saying is that you can't just because many South Africans are saying, yes, the Jews control the media, they're good in business. That doesn't mean they hate Jews. That's just, that's what they've grown up to believe and they don't attack us or they don't have bad feelings toward us. So again, maybe as you were saying, the, the more educated, more progressive may know what are the right answers to these sort of questions. And maybe your average South African didn't quite know what the right answers were. That's why they came out as the most uh, anti-Semitic uh, country. Now you were asking me, uh, how do Israelis feel about this? I, I, I don't have any, uh, uh, figures to, to give you from a recent poll, but I think that probably it would be correct to say most Israelis do feel that a certain type of uh, uh, criticism of Israel, there, there are certain red lines and beyond these red lines, it's, it's clearly anti-Semitism and they would probably point to the uh, recent attacks on Jews in the past week or two in, in, in New York, Los Angeles, London, and say, what did, what did these Jews do? Why do they deserve to be attacked? Clearly, yeah. these people hate Israel and they hate Jews. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you think Israelis care a lot about how their country is perceived by other countries? I think they do. Everyone cares about how they're perceived. They might say it, they don't, and who cares? We do what needs to be done and we don't care. But of course, everyone, everyone cares. And, and look at all the money that Israel pours into so-called Hasbara, which is public diplomacy or yeah. propaganda, for lack of a better word. Um, so, I mean, we even have this whole new ministry that was set up a few years ago that, that this is, this is their, that's dedicated just to this, to fighting BDS, uh, attempts to delegitimize Israel. And, you know, there's this growing network of shlichim, which are like envoys, young shlichim on college campuses around the world. And that's what they do is they try advocate for Israel. So Israel does care. Israel does care very much. And we're talking about events of last week. Uh, I think that was part of the reason we had such a relatively quick ceasefire because Israel understood that every day that went by was just causing damage to the country and its reputation. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move to that now because that's in the top of everybody's mind. Bari, do, do you think that if, um, this survey being carried out last week in the midst of this conflict, uh, the results that we've got here would have been uh, any different, very different? Um, there may well have been some uh, difference. Um, we've only got one uh, example to look at historically in Australia <clears throat> that I'm aware of, uh, where you can see short events changing opinion to some extent in the short term. In 2006, uh, when there was a, a conflict between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, we had two Morgan polls, one taken in July and one in August. And you saw a shift between July and August. Uh, proportion siding with Israel slipping by six points. Proportion siding with Hezbollah slipping by three points. And the proportion saying they sympathized with neither side rising by nine points. In other words, people shifted from an Israeli position or a pro Hezbollah position to saying basically a plague on both your houses. Mm. Um, they wanted the fighting to stop and probably couldn't see much point to it. Um, so I would expect uh, some changes in the course of a conflict, depending on how it was going and how, and particularly how long it had lasted. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this changes underlying views. And the Lowy Institute has conducted um, a feeling thermometer, as it's called in the business, um, asking people how they feel from very warm to very cold about a whole number of countries. And they've run this from 2006, unfortunately not from 2005, from 2006 right through to this year. And what you see in that is very little shift in feelings about Israel. Israel is around 
on the thermometer, which goes from naught to 100. But one has to be a bit careful in interpreting thermometer data. In my view, the real zero, unlike a real thermometer, is not zero. The real zero is what you'd get if you asked about the Nazi regime or about North Korea or about the Soviet Union and so on, and it doesn't do this. Uh, the lowest it's got is for Iran, which is about 30 odd percent. So my suspicion is the real zero on a thermometer is about 25 degrees. Israel's around 50 plus or minus and has been for the last 14 years that they've run this thing. So I would interpret that to mean on the cooler side of the midpoint, because the real, uh, the real thermometer runs, I think, from about 25 to probably 90 plus where you find New Zealand and uh, New Zealand in particular, but also the UK. Right. So uh, are you trying to say then in terms of responsiveness of, of attitudes towards uh, events in, in the sort of larger scheme of things that uh, people's attitudes are just uh, reflexive, but then revert? Or do they develop more slowly over a longer period of time? Um, what, what's the best way of sort of well, understanding I, the framework? Well, there's no, in the Lowy poll, there's not much evidence of a secular decline. There may be a very slight secular decline in support for Israel or feelings of warmth towards Israel. And my larger point is that um, people can react to events of the moment without it necessarily affecting their underlying views about a particular country. Now, we don't have good enough data, not nearly good enough data to know this about Israel and Hezbollah, let alone it's of course too early to know about the latest uh, conflicts. Um, but it may well be that very little changes in terms of feelings about Israel um, in the longer term. Right. Okay, so uh, I mean, one of the um, uh, the biggest impacts of uh, of the conflict has been uh, an outbreak uh, of widespread anti-Semitic uh, behaviour, hostility, uh, physical hostility to Jewish people in many countries around the world, uh, online intimidation. Um, been reports from uh, media everywhere, really, uh, with the exception, to the best of my knowledge, of um, uh, Australia. Uh, I'm notwithstanding um, online activity, uh, but I mean, uh, in terms of uh, overt uh, intimidations and uh, physical attacks on Jewish people, we haven't seen any reports of that in Australia, uh, unless I'm wrong. Um, but if that's the case, uh, what does that say about uh, the findings of this survey in terms of their accuracy, I guess? Oh, well, we're talking about two different things. One's about views and the other is about what people are prepared to do if they feel very strongly about an issue. And there's not necessarily a strong correlation between that. When we're talking about anti-Semitic attacks, we're talking even the worst circumstances of a fraction of 1% of the population involved in this sort of thing. Um, and of course, the proportion of people that are hostile to Israel on any measure is much more than a fraction of 1%. Um, so one can't use the survey figures to predict um, who is going to act violently. That's a, that's a separate matter. Mm. So you're, you're saying that uh, there's no sort of strong links between attitudes and action. No, that's, uh, that's right. Right. Uh, Judy, uh, how do you think Israelis have viewed these um, reports of attacks? Sorry? How, how do you think Israelis have viewed these reports of attacks against Jewish people? I think with concern, obviously. Um, it was on the front page of Haaretz this morning. Uh, we don't usually have on our front page stories about Jews abroad. So the fact that it made the front page of the Hebrew paper I, said, said, I believe says something. Um, going back to what you and Murray were discussing before uh, and, and about how, this, how these events might impact um, uh, upcoming surveys. Yes. I, I think it would be really interesting now to see um, how this has affected attitudes of Jews in the diaspora. 
because you know it can go both ways. The, I, I was in the United States a week and a half ago, actually, yeah, while, while this was all happening. And um, this is just anecdotal evidence. Obviously we didn't do a survey, but people were in absolute shock. Like nothing like, like this had happened before that they could remember. And, you know, on the one hand, Jews abroad could conclude from this, um, and this probably would not um, be to the liking of Israel's critics, but they might conclude that, okay, this, this proves why we need our own Jewish state. It is not safe for us here. And on the other hand, you might have Jews who are not very connected to Israel who will say, why do I have to suffer because of something that's going on thousands of miles away, away that I have no opinion about or that I am critical about? Why should I have to suffer? And this may cause them to distance themselves even further from Israel. So I would be very curious in a couple of weeks to see a survey that tries to gauge the opinion of Jews abroad and how this has affected them. Mm. I guess what, uh, one of the uh, things that we haven't explicitly uh, mentioned in terms of the recent conflict or, or, or of how attitudes are formed is that uh, ad, uh, attitudes about events and, and political situations are, are mediated through uh, our learning of them through generally through media coverage, sometimes through a family and personal experience, but in the general scheme of things through media coverage. So how, how tied are our, um, our attitudes, Murray, do you think to media coverage uh, and to what extent do people get permanently influenced by them or, or look beyond them? Oh, I imagine they are influenced by by media. Uh, we don't have any particular studies that I'm aware of connecting media in Australia with attitudes to Israel. Um, there's a good deal of concern, of course, in, in, the, in the, I imagine, both the Arab community here and the Jewish community about uh, the way these events are portrayed um, around the question of bias and so on, what would constitute a neutral account of these activities? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I don't think anybody is. Yeah. But uh, it's a contentious area. Yeah. Uh, I'd be very surprised if uh, it didn't have an impact. I mean, uh, uh, and it's only through, only through the media that most people uh, grasp that there's a conflict. It's only through the media they see, you know, particularly television, they see pictures of it and so on. I mean, social media may be changing this in ways that uh, I haven't seen explored. But I think media, to people's understanding, uh, is, is quite central. Yeah. Judy? I think I, I would agree with everything that he said. Yes, with, with what Murray said, that uh, it does influence how we think about this very much so yeah i mean in a way that's a that's a truism and may se seem banal but if we go back to the original findings uh, about australians generally balanced sympathies towards israel and, and palestinians and there was this finding that they've remained stable for the last i think five years it was which implies that they may be uh, immune to the vicissitudes of, of media uh, and so I, I think so, because in fact, as I said um, earlier, Michael, uh, um, people, although most people, as you quite rightly say, said they have not changed their views in the last five years, yeah. some people had moved uh, away from a, a pro Israeli position, and other people had moved on balance to a pro Palestinian. Yeah. If you put the two together, the gap had changed by 10 percentage points, which is quite a lot. Yeah. Um, all right. So, look, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, both of you, uh, just before we go to uh, questions from the audience, and that is about age and attitudes. Uh, I mean, we see a general trend here that uh, younger people are uh, are more sympathetic to uh, the Palestinian side of the conflict. Um, do we 
have a sense about whether that is just a generational uh, issue uh, or, or it's uh, formed and then it's generational do people just get more conservative as they get older because they've sort of seen more of the world um, you know how does the age thing translate in terms of um, attitude well, the, at the moment I think the most uh, the most likely explanation for the uh, for the younger people is is um, I think as Judy pointed out that these are people that are likely to be voting Labour and Green, and this reflects their their political positions. That's probably the single most important thing. Right. Um, whether they'll, as it were, change and become more conservative as they grow older, uh, an ageing process, uh, that I think will depend on what happens in the world. I don't think one can say in advance um, that, uh, that uh, they'll become... Uh, more conservative. It's possible that older people have become, some older people have become more radical as, in, in your terms as events have unfolded and they've changed their views. I mean, there has been, I'm sure, a very substantial move away from a sort of reflexive support for Israel. Um, and uh, there's some evidence of this in surveys conducted between the late 60s and the early 80s. Um, there was a time when, if you asked about Israel versus the Arab world, it was a lay down Mazaire. Uh, the Arab world wasn't in it. That, that, those, that era has passed. Right. For older people as well as the younger ones. Okay, uh, Judy, do you have a view about uh, age? Uh, I was thinking about age of, we I spoke before about the new Pew survey and, and Jewish Americans and the, the differences we saw in the, in the, in the age categories and their responses to Israel. Um, and I think that one is, um, is easier to understand. The, this new generation of young American Jews is already 70 plus years removed from the Holocaust. They were born after the 67 war after the 73 war, they, they never remember a time when um, Israel's existence was in danger. All, all they remember is a time when Israel was, uh, was a strong power, even a bully maybe, yeah. uh, when Israel was an occupying force, and, and, and that's what they grow up, grew up with. So that could explain a lot about why their views are so different from theirs those of their parents and grandparents. Yeah, okay. All right, look, we might uh, move to take some uh, questions from the audience now. Um, one question that came in was um, asking whether uh, Israeli leaders were perhaps too arrogant in the way that they discussed um, the conflict uh, when asked about it, rather than trying to explain or background or gain some more uh, understanding for their side uh, in terms of um, whether this shaped attitudes towards um, uh, Israel. What do you think about that, Judy? Well, I would probably want to know more specifically what statements they were referring to, but I'm assuming the gist of it is that Israeli leaders were saying, oh, we're winning this and we've had big victories and we've destroyed most of the Hamas tunnels, which it turns out now wasn't really true and they were doing a lot more bragging about this. Um, so look, the point is that um, they were talking about a initially a much longer term operation. In the end, they had to back down. And that would indicate to me that things weren't going as well as they had hoped or as they had been saying in all these statements of theirs. Mm. Um, all right. Uh, Another question here is actually more of a technical one, uh, and I'll throw it back to you, Murray. Um, how do you establish in survey whether a respondent is actually anti-Semitic, <laughs> as opposed to um, yeah. uh, ticking off their answers to questions? Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> survey researchers depend on ticking off uh, answers to questions uh, because they're talking about anti-Semitic attitudes. So the question then becomes, 
how good are the surveys and how can you validate them? Um, uh, this, this survey is a very limited um, piece of work. I mean, there's a lot of much more sophisticated work. There's not a criticism of the survey because it's not funded to do this properly, but there's much more sophisticated uh, surveys on anti-Semitism. And uh, then there's a question, which I take it is what the questioners really ask about, is how you validate them. So and that comes back to your point about, well, if someone's very anti-Semitic, do you validate that by seeing that they throw, uh, you know, bombs at the synagogues? I mean, that would be, um, I mean, one notion. Um, but people would think that someone could be anti-Semitic without doing those sort of things. So you might think about some behaviors that you would predict if someone were anti-Semitic um, um, and a range of behaviors. You could do that to validate the scale. This hasn't been done in Australia. And uh, um, I'm not sure how, how good the work is internationally, but it's a is good it, question. Is it one of those things that's virtually impossible to uh, establish in a sort of empirical sense? No, no. I mean, you could have a connection. For example, if there were an obviously anti-Semitic party, then you could relate people's attitude to their vote. Yeah. That would be one validation of that. Um, okay. Uh, Judy, this is a question about um, Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu. To what extent has Netanyahu's embrace of a former President Trump exposed the radicalism of the Israeli right to American Jews who might have earlier been able to live with a uh, liberal except for Israel mindset? I think to quite a degree, in fact, and this has come to bite him in the past couple of weeks. I mean, we have, um, we have all these Democratic uh, Congress people who have now uh, are now proposing to make aid to Israel conditional. And these were things we never saw in the past before the whole uh, BB Trump alliance. Um, BB made Israel a partisan issue. And um, if he is no longer prime minister next week, which is still an if, um, this could end up being one of the reasons that he became so disliked, not only in America, but also among average Israelis who very much valued that bipartisan relationship. He put all his eggs in the Trump basket, in the Republican basket. Mm. So you mean Israelis valuing the bipartisan relationship with America specifically? Yes, yes. Yeah. How much of that is a, a large part of their mindset? That relationship with America. Yeah, it's it's always it's it's been part of the tradition of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, and um, that all changed under Netanyahu. Yeah. Uh, do you think that that has uh, much of an impact on um, uh, Americans or Australians' attitudes towards Israel in general? Uh, definitely on uh, the views of progressive Americans and Australians. Um, I think uh, it, Bibi's very close relationship with Trump and with the, Repu with the Republican Party was definitely a huge turnoff for them. Yeah. Um, Murray, something that's just uh, struck me about this line of questioning about uh, American um, uh, attitudes is that with the new um, president in America, is that going to send a lot of cues to Australian um, uh, voters and citizens about how they perceive, I guess, the Middle East through the, the signals that come from America? I doubt it. I think um, the dominant story in Australia will remain the David and Goliath story. Um, uh, the question of uh, live conflict, uh, destruction on one side, less destruction on the other. I think yeah. that's, the, that's the big driver of the narrative, uh, the question of proportionate response. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, look, I've got another question here uh, from uh, the readers saying, was, uh, was the survey granular enough to distinguish between opposition to the occupation versus overall opposition to Israel as a Jewish state? Murray? Well, there was nothing about Israel as a Jewish state in the survey. Um, and there was nothing about the occupation as such. Um, that's the answer to the question. Yeah. Is uh, there some questions which could be asked but weren't. Is there something implied in the attitudes, though, about that? Um, so um, what, what you've got in mind? Well, that uh, it, it's... Uh, oh, Judy? Uh, yeah. Judy, yes. I yeah. would assume the question that was asked whether... I don't remember exactly how it was phrased, but something, do you think that the our Australian government should be tougher on Israel? Yeah. That, that, I mean, tougher on what? It's really the only issue it should be tougher on, right? I mean, what else? It's, it's not on Israel's relations with the US Jewish community. It's not on Israel's health care policy. It's about the no. occupation. Yes, right. it's about the occupation. I mean, there have there have been other issues uh, recently here in terms of the Malka Lifer case, but I think that question refers <laughs> implicitly to the occupation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the, the the there is stuff, of course, and we mentioned this right at the outset about um, attitudes to what the government should do, and you get, as you often get in surveys, uh, rather different responses depending on how you word the question. So we found, or the survey found. 47% of those that are interested in the issue, a very small number, about 15% or whatever it was, uh, those who are interested in the, the interested public, 47% said the government wasn't critical enough. On the other hand, uh, only 38% disagreed with the Australian government's policy. So you got a, a, you know, a real difference depending on how you framed it. And one of the weaknesses with the survey is there's not enough um, alternative ways of addressing key issues. Uh, this is a survey which has three and a half thousand respondents. And in my view, they should have used a split survey technique much more often. And one would have been the point that Judy raised uh, the thing before about the Nazi symbol, uh, banning versus allowing. Now, survey research have known for 80 years, 80 years, that there's a very big difference between a question about allowing, a question about banning or prohibiting, and a question about allowing. Mm. You get rather different responses. This would have been an opportunity to see to what extent the framing of the questions, the word in the question makes a difference to the response. This, I think, is central to understanding public opinion, and most surveys neglect it. But there's so a glimpse of it in this thing about government not being critical enough, and the, and the policies being the right one. So are you saying that people tend to uh, respond more positively to the positive or to the negative? Uh, actually, they're, 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 they're better on the banning than on the allowing, I think, is the, if you've got the ban versus allowing one. It's just the language you use. So in this case, it's not positive. Or, well, the government not critical enough and about right. Um, people are reluctant to criticise so if you word a question in an affirmative way, you're likely to get a better response than if you word it inviting a, a negative response. Um, so, the, but these things can be shown by splitting the sample and asking one half the sample one version of the question and asking the other half the sample the other version of the question and see what happens. Right, and, and what do you tend to get when you do that? Well, it'll just depend on the question, but what you will very often find is substantial differences by asking the question in different ways. And that tells you that the question, the what people think will depend on how an issue is framed. Where you don't get differences, you know that even where the question is framed in quite different ways, people's yeah. views are sufficiently well formed that they will stick to their original position. Right, okay. Um, do, do you have a sense from, uh, from this survey of whether things like re uh, religious affiliation or ethnicity uh, were relevant factors in any of the findings? I didn't look at that. Um, 
part of the problem is you get down to fairly small numbers. Uh, religious affiliation is one, and the other was gender. Ethnicity. I guess gender is another well, one. Ethnicity, of course, is a, is a, is a real problem. Uh, it would be, I mean, one of the advantages of having um, very large numbers in the survey, and 3,500 is large, is that you could look maybe at some ethnic breakdowns, mm. but it's very much a maybe. And in certain ethnic communities, there's a real question about whether people, whether you're getting the people you hope to get, or whether there's a great reluctance to, to take part in the survey, and the people that do take part are not representative of yeah. the group. This yeah. is, of course, an increasing problem in survey research with right. very low response rates. Yeah, and, and so the, the general sort of uh, way in which these surveys are received by the political class, do they, do they tend to get uh, used uh, in the formulation of policy or are they just sounding boards? You know, what's your sense of uh, how something like this would be taken by uh, politicians, advocacy groups, etc., in, in terms of their, their policy framing? Well, advocacy groups will find, people that are on the Palestinian side will find something here to, uh, to use um, in terms of the balance of opinion. Um, the Liberal, the current, current coalition government uh, won't be particularly interested in this survey uh, unless there was evidence of these being vote changing issues and the it, a survey doesn't attempt to look at them as vote changing issues. Mm. Um, unless they could see that, unless they could w establish that their net position would be enhanced electorally by becoming a bit more pro-Palestinian or a little less pro-Israel, mm. their net position, in other words, they've got to think about seats where they want to hold on to Jewish voters as against seats in which they might want to attract um, um, Arab voters. And the third thing, and not the least important, is the views of their ally, in particular, America. Yeah. And at the moment, they're not, uh, I mean, Australian foreign policy very closely follows America on the Middle East. And um, it would take an enormous amount to shake that. On the Labour side, though, um, this will be of more interest. There's a push to recognize, it's been going on for some time, to recognize Palestine, and uh, this might encourage that. Yeah. Judy, uh, you've talked about a couple of uh, surveys that, by Pew Organization, this one and others. Uh, do these things get much uh, traction with um, Israeli government and ministers? You know, um, looking at the Pew survey, for, for example, uh, so I wasn't here in Israel when it was published, but I remember it, 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 in one uh, regard, it had a, a similar uh, finding as the previous one, which is the large rate of, um, of intermarriage among Jews in the United States. I don't, I don't know what the, the rate is in Australia, but in the United States, it, it's, it's over 50%. And this, um, this finding has been used uh, by right-wing politicians in Israel, as well as Netanyahu, mm -hmm. to explain why Israel really doesn't need the support as much it is, as it used to of diaspora Jewry, because their um, feeling is the diaspora Jewish community is dying out. It's, you know, in a, in a couple of generations, there won't be any Jews left. So we have to find other allies. And this is one of the reasons, you know, this, this high rate of intermarriage is why Bibi and uh, many of the right wing politicians in Israel have found it a lot more convenient to ally themselves with the Christian conservatives, the, the evangelicals in the United States, mm. uh, who are also a huge base of support for, for Donald Trump. Um, there's, you know, much, much larger percentage of the voting public in the United States, and they um, probably, in terms of values, have, are much more similar to Netanyahu than progressive Jews are. Yeah. Um, all right, look, uh, another question from uh, our audience uh, relates to um, 
the attitudes towards uh, Israel uh, and um, attitudes by Australians to uh, our government's uh, treatment of Indigenous peoples. Uh, and one person has said that she uh, occasionally encounters strongly uh, anti-Israel feelings amongst people that she knows, but an apparent indifference to the plight of our Indigenous population. And I'm wondering, Murray, uh, whether um, there's been any um, research done comparing these sorts of attitudes uh, about various social justice and, and political uh, issues, yeah. or is this something that just comes through um, a barbecue talk? Yeah, a good question. I'm not aware of any social justice work which has talked about social justice in relation to different groups. Um, but um, I've, there's a lot of work on attitudes to Indigenous Australians. Yeah. And I'd be very surprised if people are not much more concerned about Indigenous Australians than they are about the Middle East. You would be surprised if they're not? Yes. yes. Yeah. They're much more concerned about Indigenous Australians than they are about the Middle East, yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, is that historically been the case, or do you think that that is a more recent uh, phenomenon? I would think, uh, well, I don't know, would it have been true in 1956 in Suez? I don't know. The indigenous question was so subterranean. It may have been a time when Israel was in fact more important than the question of uh, indigenous Australians, but at least since 1967, that's uh, not the case, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's also been raised uh, by some people as a, as a barometer, I guess, of um, where people's sympathies lie, that uh, people may consider to be uh, very critical of um, Israeli government policy, but less so of their own governments and whether you can draw any inferences from that or whether that's just um, the result of different um, uh, media coverage and uh, ingrained prejudices. Well, the Israeli government is a player in this in a way that the Australian government isn't. So if people are worried or critical or full of praise for the Israeli government and not so concerned one way or the other about this, about the Australian government, one can understand it. Yeah, yeah. All right, look, we're just about out of time. I've got one quick uh, question to go to you, Judy. Um, I want to read you a quote from uh, Golda Meir uh, that was on the cover of an, uh, the Australian Jewish News here a week or so ago before the ceasefire was announced. Uh, quote, if we have a choice between being dead and pitied and being alive with a bad image, we'd rather be alive and have the bad image, unquote. Uh, do you think this is an accurate way to describe Israelis' view on the subject? On the whole, I, I would say it is. Um, once Hamas attacked Israel with rockets, I, I, I would hard to, it would be very hard to find even one Israeli who would say, oh, no, no, we can't respond to that. We have to turn the other cheek. I think there was an unusual consensus, because as you know, Israelis can't agree on anything, but there seems to be a consensus that when Hamas hits you, you have to hit back. The question is, how much force do you use and how long considering the built-in advantages that Israel has? Um, so I think most Israelis believe that while the world may be saying terrible things about them now, within a week or two, this will pass. We've been through this before. It's not the first time. Um, and, I, and I think most would agree that Israel has lost the battle for public opinion. Many don't care, but many still do. And I think those who do would tend to say that the problem isn't one of public relations, but rather one of policy. Right. All right. Well, look, I think that's a good note for us to end on. Um, I'd like to thank you both, the Murray Goot uh, in Sydney and Judy Maltz in Israel for a stimulating evening. Uh, I hope you at home uh, enjoyed our discussion and uh, I look forward to um, inviting you to another one soon. Uh, and I say to you all, uh, good night and thank you very much. Thank you, Mari, and thank you, Judy.